We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. In this episode, we will be talking about the United States Intelligence Services, mainly the CIA led by its virtual reality station, Alex Station, the FBI, and the more obscure intelligence apparatus that is hardly ever mentioned, the NSA. We'll be talking about how these agencies began monitoring the venerable and notable Saudi Osama bin Laden. How far back did the intelligence apparatuses go in beginning their intelligence operation against bin Laden? Well, today I'll be detailing which agencies began monitoring bin Laden and how far back the operation went. Summer 1996. Ziad Khalil was tasked to conduct a transaction. He was to find a satellite phone for a friend. The request came from Khalid Al Fawaz, a notable Saudi who was appointed to head the London based office, which promoted constructive reform in Saudi Arabia. Khalil, a Virginia native, looked on computers and checked phone books to search for a store that sold high quality satellite phones. Khalil said to use the credit card of a fellow Saudi named Saad Al Fagi. Al Fagi, a Muslim Saudi national and former surgeon who heads the movement for Islamic reform in Saudi Arabia, is not known to most within the kingdom. Khalil would end up finding a Long Island, New York business O'Gara Satellite Networks. There, Khalil would end up purchasing for $7,000 a Compact M satellite phone, which was also the size of a laptop computer. The number assigned to the phone, 873-682-505-331, was then constructed into the main line. The phone was officially active. It was then mailed to Khalid Al Fawaz, who was visiting Missouri. The satellite phone is mailed by Al Fawaz to Tora Bora, Afghanistan. However, U.S. intelligence had all along began monitoring the transaction, even from the very beginning. The FBI had known that Khalil purchased the phone from O'Gara Satellite Networks. The phone was then tapped through NSA decryption by the time it began its use in Afghanistan. The phone belonged to a very important man who was just becoming known to most every single body in the world regarding the intelligence apparatuses. That man would be named Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden began using the phone almost immediately. According to prosecution regarding the trial of Wadi al Hajj. The calls went to many high-profile Al-Qaeda numbers and also to Al-Fawaz. More than 200 calls were placed to a Yemen home owned by Ahmed al A 100 calls each were placed to the Sudan and to the Iran. Around 60 calls were placed to Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and to Baku, Azbaristan. 16 calls to Kenya. Four of those calls went to Wadi al Hajj home in Nairobi, Kenya. Six of those calls went to various locations in the United States, and four calls went to Malaysia. 
but it was the number from the Yemen home in the city of Sana which caught the NSA analyst's attention. Why was this number the most frequently called by bin Laden? Who was bin Laden speaking to? What were those calls about? The agency decides to red flag the number based out of Yemen. It was traced to the owner, Ahmed al Hada, whom authorities learned was a close associate to bin Laden from his participation during the Soviet Afghan war, which saw al Hada fight alongside bin Laden during the course of the conflict. The number 967-1-200578 wasn't publicly known until another Al-Qaeda operative, Mohammed Daoud al-Hohahi, was arrested for his participation in the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombing in Kenya by FBI authorities. Through the trial of al-Hohahi, the number went public as per the trial transcripts in 1998. The number nevertheless was still in use even after the September 11, 2001 attacks, in which the number was also reported by The Guardian in 1998. Just a few months after being expelled from the Sudan, bin Laden had declared his first fatwa against the United States. The title, Declaration of Jihad Against the Americans Occupying the Land of the Two Holiest Sites, was decreed by bin Laden on August 23, 1996. In it, he showed his dissatisfaction for the Saudi Kingdom's decision to have the Kufar to stay in the country, more so that it was the United States military. One statement made by bin Laden showed how much he had such held such vitriol. Quote, Muslims burn with anger at America for its own good. America should leave Saudi Arabia. There is no more important duty than pushing the American enemy out of the Holy Land. The presence of the United States Crusader military forces on land, sea, and air of the states of the Islamic Gulf is the greatest danger threatening the largest oil reserve in the world. The existence of these forces in the area will provoke the people of the country and induce aggression on their religion, feelings, and prides and push them to take armed struggle against the invaders occupying the land. Due to the imbalance of power between our armed forces and the enemy forces, a suitable means of fighting must be adopted using fast-moving light forces that work under complete secrecy. In other words, to initiate a guerrilla war where the sons of the nation and not the military forces take part in it. End quote. The FABWA decree was sent to most Saudi-based media offices in Europe, but it was the London Arabic newspaper Al-Quds Al-Arabi whom first published the declaration. Meanwhile, the NSA continued to monitor the bin Laden satellite phone, as well as building a satellite cable near Madagascar to start monitoring the Yemen home. Although the NSA states it started tapping the Yemen home in 1998, some within the CIA and FBI believed it started monitoring the phone line as soon as they found out about it in 1996. What made Bin Laden's satellite phone easy to track and listen to was that the satellite phone was not encrypted. NSA voice interceptor operators and linguistics translate, transcribe, and write summaries of the calls all without any encryption methods. The phone was basically a treasure trove of information for the intelligence community. Michael Scheuer, chief of CIA's counterterrorism center, Alex Station, stated the sheer importance which came from monitoring the phone. Quote, Bin Laden's satellite phone is a godsend because it gave us an idea not only of where he was in Afghanistan, but where Al-Qaeda as an organization was established because there were calls to various places in the world. End quote. The CIA Alex station begins to monitor Yemen Hub and begin tapping the house and also begin human intelligence or human. Michael Shoya learns of this communication conduit through a CIA officer detailed to the NSA and stationed overseas. The NSA officer is not publicly known. However, the CIA begins to press the NSA to release cables regarding incoming calls. 
since the CIA has no access to the calls made and received at the Yemen hub. Shoya was given the runaround at first, and the NSA refused to share these cables. The agency was afraid of being compromised by other agencies if they shared any details regarding their monitoring of bin Laden's satellite phone and the monitoring of the Yemen hub. Shoya was not deterred in the least. In December of 96, Shoya would direct and visit Deputy Director of the NSA Barbara McNamara and implored her to share the other half of the cables with the, uh, the CIA. His persistent nature was enough for McNamara. She would end up threatening legal action against the Counterterrorism Center if they compromised the NSA's monitoring operation. Shoya was asked to relent, and they began to construct its own listening post. February 8, 1998. A group calling itself the World Islamic Front issues a statement read by Osama bin Laden. The group, made up of the following members, Ayman al-Zwahiri, Amir of the Jihad group in Egypt, Abu Yasser Rafai Ahmad Taha of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, Sheikh Mir Hamza, Secretary of the Jamat al ulima in Pakistan, and Fazlur Rahman, Amir of the Jihad movement in Bangladesh. The fatwa was more pronounced and far more generalized than the one issued in 1996. This time, the fatwa declared that U.S. and Israeli citizens were now fair game for reprisals. Quote, the ruling to kill the Americans and their allies, civilians and military, is an individual duty for every Muslim who can do it in any country in which it is possible to do it. In order to liberate the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Holy Mecca from their grip, and in order for their armies to move out of all the lands of Islam, defeated and unable to threaten any Muslim. This is in accordance with the words of the Almighty Allah, and fight the pagans all together as they fight you all together, and fight them until there is no more tumult or oppression, and there prevail justice and faith in Allah." End quote. The issuing of the declaration was now advocating a total war, a war that was being monitored from the shadows by the intelligence agencies that was looking from afar. The NSA would monitor calls between two high-level Al-Qaeda operatives, Abu Hafs al-Masri, who would later be named Muhammad Ataf, who is the Al-Qaeda military commander, and Wadi al Hajj, bin Laden's personal financier, between the months of January and February of 98. What is being said in these calls, and the many thousands before and after, are not shared with any investigative agency. al Hajj travels to Islamabad, Pakistan in February, and contacts Kenyan operatives there. The calls also monitor al Hajj giving the address of a hotel in Peshawar, where he is staying. On February 7th, he calls Kenyan cell member Fazul Abdul Muhammad. Alex Station would employ FBI agents to the center. The data from the virtual reality station is hardly shared with the competing agency. Dan Coleman from the I-49 Counterterrorism Unit in New York had received information from Alex Station, the CIA counterterrorism station, which shared to FBI agents about where Wadi al Hajj is currently staying in Nairobi, Kenya. The staff at the counterterrorism unit believe Wadi al Hajj could be a valuable asset. They deployed Dan Coleman, two CIA agents, and a Kenyan police officer to forcibly enter al Hajj's house in Nairobi, Kenya with a search warrant. They take his computer and find a slew of incriminating evidence after decryption. One finding that showed an intricate detail of the East Africa terrorist cell was a letter belonging to Wadi al Hajj. One part of the letter stated the wish for a global caliphate. Quote, the second matter is that I would recommend to the good and wise Supreme Commander, which I implore to God, to keep safe, to work hard, to return the caliphate to earth and fight the forces of atheism 
and dictators who wreaked havoc on Earth. We, the East Africa cell members, do not want to know about the operation's plans since we are just implementers. We trust our command and appreciate their work and know that they have a lot of problems. But my advice here is for the practical part, only since we started the project for reestablishing the Muslim state is a collective effort and not an individual one. We are all part of it." End quote. The acknowledgement of war against America based on bin Laden's fatwa of 1996, in which, quote, as you know, the decision to declare war on America was taken, and we only know about it from the news media. And we should, all, we should have known about that decision, and the decision only, and not the plans so that we could take the necessary precautions and to prevent causing any complications or failures in your plans due to our ignorance of them." End quote. However, more profound was after this investigation, El Hajj would move back to the United States on August 23, 1997. There he goes before a grand jury and is allowed to leave. While the FBI monitoring Al-Fawaz, they now have the Islamic American Relief Agency on the radar screen because Khalil is one of the agency's eight regional U.S. directors. Khalil is also being monitored as he continues to purchase minutes for bin Laden's satellite phone, which continues until 1998. On August 5, 1998, the NSA picks up two calls, one from Khalid al-Midar, a known al-Qaeda operative, the calls to his father, Ahmed al-Hada, in Yemen. Another call to bin Laden's home is from al-Fawaz. He is told by someone using bin Laden's phone regarding a plan to bomb two U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya in East Africa. On August 7, 1998, two U.S. embassies are bombed by Saudi martyrs in trucks packed with explosives. However, if the NSA was monitoring the satellite phone of Osama bin Laden, as well as the CIA, and NSA monitoring the Yemen hub as well, how did they miss this crucial operation? Surely they were talking about this over the phone lines. According to John Miller in his book, The Cell, published in 2002, quote, what has become clear with time is that the facets of the East Africa plot have been known beforehand to the FBI, the CIA, the State Department, and to Israeli and Kenyan intelligence services. No one can seriously argue that the horrors of August 7, 1998 couldn't have been prevented." End quote. The book also reiterates that the intelligence agencies involved with Mitre and Al-Qaeda had to have known what was about to transpire. And, quote, inexplicable as the intelligence failure was, more baffling still was that al-Qaeda correct, correct, correctly presumed that a major attack could be carried out by a cell that the U.S. agents had already uncovered, end quote. Mohammed Daoud al Hawali, who by his own admission backed out of the truck which exploded before the security gate, at Nairobi, Kenya, Al Hawali, however, suffered severe burns to his back as the truck detonated. He went to Nairobi Hospital, where doctors tended to his wounds, but they noticed the distinct marks due to powder burns from explosives. There, Al Hawali was interviewed by Kenyan authorities. He was arrested on suspicion of being involved with the bombing of the embassy. The FBI was notified of Al Hawali's arrest and sent John Antasev from the FBI's counterterrorism unit, I-49, led by John O'Neill. There, Antasep would interview privately with al Hawali. After some pleasant chat, the conversation was focused on al Hawali's participation with the attacks. Antasep would also retrieve a number from al Hawali. The number was supposed to be called during and after the attacks. According to al Hawali, it was the base of operations for the all calls throughout the world regarding Al-Qaeda and their communications to a hub in Yemen. A 
According to an LA Times report from August 28, 1998, quote, in his confession, al Awalhi also said he had attended conferences and meetings with bin Laden, as well as a press conference bin Laden held in May in coast Afghanistan. al Awalhi said he was aware bin Laden had issued an edict described as a fatwa or religious order urging Muslims to kill Americans, the affidavit said, end quote. The number 967-1-200578 was the number to the Al-Qaeda Yemen hub owned by Ahmed al Haddam. This information would later be addressed in al Hawali's trial in 1998. Since 1998, with the number now in public record, it continued to be used by Al-Qaeda. Seemingly unaware that now anyone willing to do some slight research and uncover this information now would know the number to Al-Qaeda's secret base of operations. Meanwhile, the NSA and the CIA would continue to monitor the Yemen hub without being compromised. After the attacks, the United States and Saudi Arabia jointly offered a reward of $15 million for the capture of Osama bin Laden. It later learned that after the 9-11 attacks, that future 9-11 hijackers, Khalid al-Madar, Nawaf al-Hazmi, and Salem al-Hazmi had some level of participation in the attacks of the U.S. embassies in East Africa. The warnings were there, according to Kenyan authorities, but federal and global intelligence agencies denied that they knew about the details of the attack, even going as far as suggesting the pre-warnings were, quote, overblown, suggesting that they still undermined al-Qaeda's capabilities, which would, of course, contradict those from the I-49 unit at the FBI and Alex Station at the CIA. Wadi al Haj would soon be arrested for his role in the embassy bombings and found to be guilty. He received a full life sentence with, where his wife, April al Haj, vehemently showed her vitriol for the State Department's prosecuting her husband on such flimsy evidence relating to the attacks. April al Haj would go on to state that it was the U.S. government who gave people like Wadi al Haj the full approval to go to war against the Soviets. Quote, that was a U.S.-backed war. The U.S. encouraged and supported it. They said it was totally legitimate for us Muslims to go there. I didn't see the memo about when we were supposed to stop. Did you? End quote. Prudence Bushnell, the U.S. ambassador to Kenya at the time of the bombings, wrote in a 1999 cable filed in the civil case, quote, let me be blunt. Last year, when this mission raised the vulnerability of the previous embassy buildings, we received informal feedback that some in Washington thought we were overreacting. End quote. Bushnell would author a book about the bombings and the intelligence failures that went unanswered. The book, Terrorism, Betrayal, and Resilience, My Story of the 1998 U.S. Embassy Bombings, would question why thousands of injured Kenyans did not receive medical compensation from the American government, and why the CIA and FBI refused to share critical intelligence that might have prevented the tragedy. On September 24, 1998, British authorities would arrest Khalid al-Fawaz, along with six others, suspected of being involved with the East Africa embassy bombings from a covert intelligence operation code named Operation Challenge. The men were suspected of being involved with al-Jihad. Al-Fawaz would later be convicted of being involved with the attacks and sentenced to life imprisonment in 2015. The NSA, however, would lose the track of bin Laden's satellite phone in 1998. According to White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, it was the media who reported the story that the NSA were listening in onto bin Laden's satellite uh, phone. Quote, one of the worst cases was the reporting on the U.S. ability to listen to Osama bin Laden's satellite phone in the late 90s. Because of that reporting, he stopped using that phone and the country lost valuable intelligence, end quote. However, this turned out not to be the case. According to CIA officials, it was from an August 17, 1998 Washington Post story that triggered bin Laden's decision to stop using the satellite phone. 
The story was from Vincent Canestrato, a former CIA counterterrorism official, who would be quoted as saying, quote, I do not have current access to intelligence collection data techniques, nor am I aware of the specific nature of any intelligence information the U.S. intelligence community has on bin Laden's alleged responsibility, end quote. CIA officials would later state bin Laden had not been aware of the story reported by the Washington Post. He would have still used the phone. Meanwhile, Alex Station would undertake integral changes to its command structure, starting with the demotion of its former chief, Michael Scheuer, who had become too insular even to his superiors. On June 26, 1999, Richard Blee would become the new deputy chief with Kofor Black, the new counterterrorism director. The decisions came from George Tenet, the director of the CIA. One year prior, Tenet would openly declare war on Al-Qaeda after the fatwa issued by bin Laden. With Black, the CTC had a real clandestine type official who was willing to get his hands dirty. Black would outline a comprehensive operation on how to plan and execute bin Laden. By September, the plan, as it was so aptly named, called for the covert operation to sublet covert teams into Afghanistan and monitor from a short distance the bin Laden Khaldeen training camp. The plan was outlined this way, quote, they sought to surround Afghanistan with secret covert bases for CIA operations, as many bases as they could arrange. Then they would mount operations from each of the platforms, trying to move inside Afghanistan and as close to bin Laden as they could to recruit agents and to attempt capture operations. Black wanted recruitments, and he wanted to develop commando or paramilitary strikes teams made up of officers and men who could blend into the region's Muslim populations, end quote. December 29th, 1999. Jordanian authorities arrest Ziad Khalil. He immediately cooperates with the investigators. They find out he had been helping Hamas through the Islamic Association for Palestine, using a portion of the funding which came from the charity, or Zakat, the FBI also links him to more notable Islamic mosques, the al Kifa Refugee Center, a charity front with ties to both bin Laden and the CIA in Brooklyn. Once in custody, Khalil cooperates with the FBI and is said to provide crucial evidence against bin Laden's U.S. operations. However, he is quickly released. Meanwhile, United Press International reporter Richard Sale would publish a report about the enormous amount of metadata the NSA had collected over the many years regarding Al-Qaeda throughout the world. Quote, the United States has scored notable success in an information war against the organization of terror suspect Osama bin Laden. U.S. hackers have gone into foreign bank accounts and deleted or transferred money and jammed or blocked the group's cell or satellite phones. End quote. At around this time, General Peter Shoemaker and General Hugh Shelton would begin a joint military operation meant to use technological means to collect metadata for the Department of Defense, similar to Alex Station of the CIA. It was codenamed Able Danger, led by a team of five of the military's top logistics and tech-savvy minds. It would collect thousands and thousands of data accumulating to three terabytes, showing two cells operating inside the United States, one led by Omar Abdel Rahman, the Brooklyn cell, and one cell led by Muhammad Atta, or the Hamburg cell. The operation was not supported by CIA. However, after the 9-11 attacks, the information, as well as the operation, was never mentioned in the 9-11 Commission final report, even though that 9-11 director Commission uh, Report Director Philip Zelikow had interviewed Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, Schaefer, who was part of the Able Danger team. Chris Kojum, a 9-11 Commission staffer, would tell a staffer of Congressman Kurt Weldon, who was investigating the matter behind Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer and the Able Danger team, that the Able Danger operation was not something 
the 9-11 Commission was interested in because, quote, it didn't fit with the story we wanted to tell, end quote. The NSA in 1999 would also learn for the first time of the name Nawaf al-Hazmi through a call they were monitoring through the Yemen hub. This information is never shared with any other agency. The NSA would later go on to say that it wasn't necessary to share this information with anyone as it didn't meet with the NSA guidelines to share personal data with any investigative agency. They also learned of the name Khalid al-Midar this information, however, was shared with Alex Station, but do not tell them of his close connection to Nawaf al-Hazmi. Meanwhile, the NSA intercepts more calls involving Khalid al-Midar, who is an al-Qaeda, which is uh, involving the al-Qaeda communications hub in Sana'a, Yemen, with his family, in which he marries the daughter of Ahmed al-Hada, Hoda al-Hada. The identity of the person he is talking to and the content of the intercepts is so sensitive that the whole passage regarding these communications is redacted in the 9-11 Congressional's Inquiry Report. The NSA would begin to collect more sensitive data between 1999 to 2001, yet most of this information was never shared amongst the CIA and the FBI. The 9-11 Commission would also hardly interview NSA Director Michael Hayden regarding why they never shared this data to anyone else. Who knows what the NSA had transcribed with the thousands of calls made to the Yemen home of Ahmed al Hada between 1996 and 2001. Just days later, after finding out Al Hazmi and Al Midar's names, a series of calls were made on December 29, 1999, is heard by the NSA. These calls would reveal that several men were to attend a very high-level meeting with notable high-ranking Al-Qaeda leaders from around the world. Future 9-11 hijackers Khalid al-Midar, Nawaf al-Hazmi, and Salim al-Hazmi are to attend an important Al-Qaeda summit meeting in Malaysia in January of 2000. This information would be shared with the CIA's Alex station and its CTC unit. The FBI's I-49 unit, as well as the regional New York City field office, are also informed about the revelation uncovered by the NSA. The reason enough for sharing this information was simple. The NSA wanted these agencies to photograph and collect as much data as possible about who these men were and looked like so they could be shared with the NSA. Khalid al midars full name was mentioned in one call. The NSA only passes on his first name. The Al-Qaeda meeting would be fully monitored by the CIA and Malaysian authorities. The meeting was held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia between the dates of January 5th to January 8th of 2000. Yazid Sufat, a businessman from Malaysia, would hold the meetings in his condominium. He is a member of the terrorist group Jemaah Islamia, located in Malaysia. The meeting would hold many luminaries of the terrorist Islamic world, including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ridwan Isamuddin, or Hambali, Nawaf al-Hazmi, Khalid al-Midar, Salim al-Hazmi, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Taufik bin Atash, or Khalad, Abu Bara al-Tazi, Abu al-Rashim al-Nashri, and Fahad al-Kuso. The Malaysian Secret Service would monitor the location of the meeting by taking a number of photographs of the men coming in and out of the residence. At the request of the CIA, they asked the Malaysian Secret Service to pass the information on to the United States. The CIA would be the only agency to have photographs of the men attending the meeting. They would not be shared with the FBI. It wasn't until hours after the attacks in New York that the CIA would show a photograph of Khalad to FBI agent Ali Soufan and give his name as well. But by then, it was much too late. The information to stop many of these terrorist attacks would also come into question from the Joint House inquiry into the 9-11 attacks. Carl Levin, a committee member, 
would berate CIA Director George Tenet for not sharing information with the FBI regarding the Wafa Hazmi dual entry visa, as well as Khalid al Madar, to which Tenet had denied not sharing information, but didn't think the information Alex Station had properly vetted. Tenet, unknown to the joint inquiry, would commit perjury regarding how no one read the cables about Al Hazmi having a dual U.S. visa. FBI agents assigned to Alex Station disagree. Doug Miller, one of those FBI officers assigned to Alex Station, had read the cable regarding Al Hazmi and Al Midar's passport and U.S. visa, which were photographed by CIA agents while Al Midar was in the United Arab Emirates Hotel. Miller drafted a cable warning the FBI headquarters about both men now available to enter the United States, that they were both Al-Qaeda operatives who were also involved with the U.S. Embassy attacks in 1998. The cable, which was read by Alex Station liaison officer Michelle Ann Casey, who would go on to Tom Wilshire, the deputy director of Alex Station, Shep Wilshire would inform Casey to put a hold on sending. Mark Rossini, another FBI agent assigned to Alex Station, saw the cable was on hold per Wilshire. He went straight to Casey and asked why the cable had not been sent. Rossini would later tell Frontline PBS, quote, This was not a matter for the FBI. The next Al-Qaeda attack is going to happen in Southeast Asia, and their visas for America are just a diversion. You are not to tell the FBI about it. When and if we want the FBI to know about it, we will. Rossini recalled going to Miller's crucible a cubicle right after his conversation with Casey. He looked at me like I was speaking a foreign language. We were both stunned and could not understand why the FBI was not going to be told about this. End quote. Both Khalid al Minar and Awafa Hazmi entered the United States after their meeting in Malaysia on January 15, 2001. The NSA continued to monitor the calls of both men, even intercepting the calls while they were in Malaysia before he left for the Al Qaeda summit meeting. Al Qaeda, um, Al Midar, would stop over in Dubai of the United Arab Emirates, and this is where the CIA broke into his hotel room and they photographed his passport. Uh, which would detail his full name. And that information was sent to Alex Station. The NSA would not lose track of Al Midar and Al Hazmi. Meanwhile, the CIA, led by Richard Blee in a White House daily brief of the National Security Council, would claim that the CIA mysteriously lost track of both men while they were in the United while they were in Malaysia. The intelligence warnings throughout 2001 was enormous. Countries like Great Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Israel, Canada, Saudi Arabia gave vague warnings, even, even stating that there was going to be a large-scale attack from bin Laden. Meanwhile, cities in the United States, such as Minneapolis and Arizona, FBI field, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, FBI field officers would warn their superiors that an unusually high number of Arab males had begun flight training lessons in those respective cities and elsewhere throughout the Southwest. Their FBI superiors brushed off these warnings as nothing more than exaggerating discrepancies. Meanwhile, inside the United States, Israeli Mossad operatives managed to, manage to monitor the movements of the Hamburg cell, led by Mohammed Atta, Mawan al Shehi, and Ziad Jara, who is living separately from them throughout the East Coast, such as New York, New Jersey, and Florida. Meanwhile, Saudi GID officers, General Intelligence Directorate officers, began monitoring Khalid al-Madar, Nawaf al-Hazmi, and Hani Hanjour out in the West Coast, mainly California and Arizona. The CIA's Alex Station Chief, Richard Blee, would tell White House officials in a debriefing in 2000 that they had lost track of al-Madar and al-Hazmi and that the NSA, however, had not. The NSA had managed to locate the phone of Al Midar while in Bangkok, Thailand on January 8th of 2000. This information was never shared with any agency. Again, it seemed that the NSA 
had always been in constant contact with members of the Yemen hub and al-Qaeda, while the CIA was just steps behind and the FBI kept in the dark. While 9-11 Commission Director Philip Zelikow states that the NSA would not have the technological capabilities to decipher the calls made out of the Yemen hub, intelligence historian Matthew Aid states that this is far from the case. In an interview with ProPublica in 2013, quote, back in 2001, NSA was routinely tracking the identity of both sides of a telephone call, end quote. However, what the NSA had known since 1992 was far more sensational, massive in its totality, and rather damning to the agency. The metadata collected by the NSA, the thousands of phone calls monitored from the Bin Laden satellite phone to the Yemen hub, is absolutely enormous. The absence of sharing this remarkably important data with anyone outside the agency could be seen as criminal negligence and could also be seen as being culpable of complicity to a high degree in regards to certain terrorist attacks. According to Thomas Drake, former NSA senior executive, in his interview with Barbara Coppell of The Nation in 2013, Coppell, what did you tell the Saxby Chambliss Congressional Subcommittee and the Congressional Joint Inquiry? Drake, I can't say fully because it's classified, but I showed that the NSA knew a great deal about the 9-11 threats and Al-Qaeda, electronically tracking various people and organizations for years since its role is to collect intelligence. The problem is it wasn't sharing all of the data. If it had, other parts of government could have acted on it and more than likely NSA could have stopped, and I say stopped, 9-11. Later, it could have located Al-Qaeda at the very time the U.S was scouring Afghanistan. It's true that there were systematic failures throughout the intelligence system, but NSA was a critical piece of it. I gave both committees prima facie evidence with documents. One was an early 2001 NSA internal document detailed multi-year study of Al-Qaeda and sympathetic groups. Movements that revealed what NSA knew, could have done, and should have done. It was astonishingly well-analyzed current intelligence. Soon after 9-11, some NSA analysts called me about it. Why? Because they were pulling their hair out, knowing they had this information, and they couldn't get NSA leadership to share the report with the rest of the intelligence community. Even though it's mandatory, it was actionable information. Remember the time period. We were in the early part of the war in Afghanistan. People needed to act on it to unravel Al-Qaeda networks. But NSA leaders deliberately decided not to disseminate it. So the analysis about what it knew before and after 9-11 got buried very deeply because it would really have made them look bad. In fact, after the analyst called me to complain, I told my superior, Maureen Baginski, director of signals intelligence, who was the number three person at NSA, but instead of acting on it, she got mad at me. She said, Tom, I wish you'd never brought this to my attention. Copel, why? Drake, because she no longer had plausible deniability. End quote. After the September 11, 2001 attacks, the foreign agencies of Israel and Saudi Arabia were also unchecked by the State Department, who had no idea they were even here, or even the FBI. It was the FBI who had to manage the after effects, or even allowed many of the Israeli operatives who were using moving companies located in New York, New Jersey, and Florida, and Florida to monitor the hijackers to be deported without any follow-up investigation. The Saudis, were left to leave the country, many of them high-ranking officials known to many within the State Department. Two congressional inquiries, the 9-11 Commission and Joint House Inquiry, would never even mention the foreign agencies from Saudi Arabia and Israel in their final reports, 
nor would they even mention about Able Danger or what Thomas Drake had mentioned to them in closed door ascensions. The obvious question is, how much did the National Security Agency uncover since 1996? Unless the public has access to that transcribed data, we will be left to our imagination. It gave rise to numerous conspiracy theories who have come under daunting public scrutiny over the next 20 years, some that even exist to this day, about how the intelligence agencies were seemingly allowing Al-Qaeda operatives to travel freely and conduct operations worldwide without interference. From the Kobar Towers bombing, the U.S. Embassy bombings, the coal bombing, to the 9-11 attacks, that these incidents were allowed to happen. Can you blame some of them? That ends this episode of The Dark and Down. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald, and I'll see you in the next episode.